Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. So today I want to talk about 10 horror novels that I have found myself recently recommending left and right to anybody who will listen. Uh, I have a lot of like favorite books that I talk about constantly on my channel. A lot of them happen to be like my top reads of every year or my favorite novel of all time. Stephen King's It being one of them. I talk about The Chestnut Man by um, Sword Spice Drop all the time. But I realized that recently I've been recommending a lot of books that I have read very recently or books that over the years have still continued to stick with me that I still keep going back to whenever anybody's like, I really want to read a great horror story. I want to breeze through it. I want to get out of my reading slump. You know, these are books that I just always, always, always want to suggest to people, but they aren't books that I tend to talk about too, too much on my channel. Maybe two of them are. Um, but I thought it would be fun to do the books, to do a video on 10 horror novels that I have been consistently recommending to uh, friends, family, and pretty much anybody who will listen. And I think it's, a bunch of them are by authors that we're all probably really familiar with, but there are also some books on here that I don't really talk about that much on my channel anymore, even though in real life I talk about them all the time. So first up, we have to start with an Anya Allborn novel. This is for anybody who wants something scary, psychological, familial horror, and something written by a real badass female author. I love Anya Allborn's work. I have been talking endlessly about her novel Brother. It was my top read of 2023, um, but this was pretty darn close to that level of excellence and terror. So yes, this is The Devil Crept In. Um, I'm gonna read the back of the book really quickly for y'all. It says, young Jude Brighton has gone missing. And while the search for him is in full swing, here in the small town of Deer Valley, Oregon, the locals are starting to lose hope. They're well aware that the first 48 hours are critical. And after that, the odds usually point to a worst case scenario. And despite Stevie Clark's youth, he knows that too. He's seen the cop shows. He knows what each ticking moment may mean for Jude, his cousin and best friend. It's like the stories from years ago of that boy, Max Larson, who was found dead after also disappearing under mysterious circumstances. And then there were the animals, pets gone missing out of yards. For years, the residents of Deer Valley have either murmured about or tried very hard to not talk about these unsolved crimes, or that a killer may still possibly be lurking around their quiet town. Now, fear is reborn. And for Stevie, who is determined to find out what really happened to Jude, the awful truth may be too horrifying to imagine. <sighs> this book is so scary. It will get under your skin. There is so many layers of relationships in this story that bring into question where does your loyalty lie? Um, are you determined to be loyal to somebody because they are a family member, because they are a best friend, even when they start to do horrible, horrible, horrible things? Set in a really, really small town. It is told primarily through the lens of, I believe, a 12-year-old boy, um, and it is absolutely brilliant. This is probably my second favorite thing that Anya Allborn has ever written and I recommend it probably just as much as I recommend Brother because I just think it is absolutely terrifying um, and so well crafted and eerie and just a total breath of fresh air at times. Um, it also reminds me quite a lot of like the themes in Rosemary's Baby but also very much akin to the Legend of the Jersey Devil though it isn't set in New Jersey, let alone the East Coast, but I really, really love this and the folklore that is behind the story that she created, and I think it's really, truly scary. All right, next up, I think this is the largest book that I have on the list. This book is like almost 500 pages or oh, almost 600 pages, um, and this is A Child Alone with Strangers by Philip Fricasse. The cover might not look super terrifying, but this is a whirlwind journey. Philip Fricasse is one of those authors who his writing style I really like, but I feel like a lot of times stories start to fall flat for me as the ending unravels. This book is not that. This is a really, really, um, this is a really, really impressive book for me. And it's the book that continues to keep me wanting to read Philip Fricasse. And I, I've been told a lot of times that his shorter work tends to be superior, but this is, I think, the longest thing he's written, and I think it's the best thing I've ever read from him. I'm gonna read the inside flap for you. When nine-year-old Henry Thorne miraculously survives an accident that claims his father's life, he finds himself changed. Upon waking from a coma, he can now read people's thoughts, see their feelings. When Henry recuperates and grapples with his newfound abilities, his family is compensated a small fortune by those responsible for the accident. 
The highly publicized case catches the eye of lifelong criminal Jim Cady, who hatches a plan to kidnap Henry for ransom. When Jim's plan goes into motion, Henry is taken, hidden in an abandoned farmhouse surrounded by miles of forest, while Jim and his crew wait for the drop. But upon arrival, Henry's abilities alert him to something surprising and horrible. They are not alone. Henry connects with a strange force living in the woods and uses that bond to wreak havoc against his captors. Unknown to Henry, however, is that the ancient being has its own reasons for wanting the interlopers gone. There is something hidden beneath the house, tucked away in the dark, damp root cellar, waiting for its return. This is another story that's told through the eyes of a child. Um, but I think in doing so, just elevates this novel to new heights. Henry is such a likable lead. Um, he's so innocent and he's so fragile and at the same time so powerful. And I just love this entire story. Definitely check the trigger warnings in this book because there are definitely several of them. Um, but this is one of the best unique spins on a coming of age story I have ever read. And it even has these like elements of cosmic horror that really work well within the story and make it very, very scary. Um, there's a lot of elements of this too that really do remind me of um, like the monster of the week in the X-Files. I really, really like uh, the monster. I like how there is both this kind of cosmic entity alongside of like the evil of humanity, which is like our bad guys who have um, kidnapped Henry for ransom. Um, and yet it, it doesn't really feel like the cliche where the monsters aren't to be as feared as humanity that you see a lot in like zombie horror. It really is very well balanced and we have to see a small child overcoming those terrors to make it through the novel and I just adore this book. I read it so quickly. It was 600 pages and I just, I would read like 100 pages a day. I didn't want to put it down and it just sealed me as a Philip Fricasse fan and I am excited to see him write more books in this style. Um, because Boys in the Valley and Gothic, again, very, very well written, and I really like his voice and tone, but they just kind of fell apart at the end, whereas this one, I think, is much better at sticking the landing and very satisfying with what you get out of it. Okay, next up, I have been talking about this book on my channel probably since I like, read it and started this channel, um, and this is My Best Friend's Exorcism by Grady Hendrix to this day. I think it is the best thing that Grady Hendrix has ever written, and I think if you want to get introduced to Grady Hendrix, this is definitely the book to start with. I'm going to read the back of the book real quick. High school sophomores Abby and Gretchen have been best friends since fourth grade. But after an evening of skinny dipping goes disastrously wrong, Gretchen begins to act different. She's moody, she's irritable, and bizarre incidents keep happening whenever she's nearby. Abby's investigation leads her to some startling discoveries, and by the time their story reaches its terrifying conclusion, the fate of Abby and Gretchen will be determined by a single question. Is their friendship powerful enough to beat the devil? Like an unholy hybrid of beaches and the exorcist, My Best Friend's Exorcism blends teen angst, adolescent drama, unspeakable horrors, and a mix of 80s pop songs into a pulse-pounding supernatural thriller. This, in my opinion, is Grady Hendrick's masterpiece. It is so funny while being so terrifying at the same time. And it's just blending horror and humor together seamlessly and flawlessly. Our characters are really likable. Um, it's, it's very great. It's, it's such a like fun setting. I believe it's set in um, like South Carolina. It's like the height of the 80s. Um, all of the chapters are told through the lens of 80s songs. Like it's so much fun to read while still being a scary story. And I really love how Grady Hendrix is so good at blending um, those two categories. And I think this is just the absolute best version of that. Okay, next up. I keep thinking about this book ever since I read it back in November. And that is What Kind of Mother by Clay McCloy Chapman. If you've been on my channel for a while, you know that I absolutely hated his last novel, Ghost Eaters. Um, and I know people love it, and I understand why people love it, which is why I continue to read his work, because I got it. I didn't like it, but I got it. Um, so I had to pick this up, and I just thought the cover was so cool and so creepy. Um, and it was absolutely not at all what I expected, and I find the title to be extremely misleading, but I couldn't put this book down. No matter how weird and bizarre and over-the-top and strange it was, his writing pulled me in and I didn't want to put this down. I'm going to read the inside flap, even though the inside flap is a little misleading. 
After striking out on her own as a teen mom, Maddie Price is forced to return to her hometown of Brandywine, Virginia with her 17-year-old daughter. With nothing to her name, she scrapes together a living as a palm reader at the local farmer's market. It's there that she connects with her old high school flame, Henry McCabe, now a reclusive local fisherman whose infant son Skylar went missing five years ago. Everyone in town is sure Skylar is dead, but when Maddie reads Henry's palm, she's haunted by strange and disturbing visions that suggest otherwise. As she follows the thread of these visions, Maddie discovers a terrifying nightmare waiting at the center of the labyrinth, and it's coming for everyone she holds dear. Combining supernatural horror with domestic suspense into a visceral exploration of parental grief, What Kind of Mother cements Clay McCoy Chapman's reputation as a star in the 21st century's Richard Matheson. There is so much body horror in this book, and there is so much, like, um, obscure folklore in this novel that wasn't created for the novel. Clay McCoy Chapman was actually very much inspired by folklore from different cultures and explains it in depth in this. Um, and it is so wacky and so weird that, and borderline Lovecraftian, which is something that I'm so normally not a fan of, but I needed to know what happened. And this is just a testament to how good of a writer Clay McCoy Chapman is, that he is able to so perfectly capture a weird, whimsical tone and convince a reader that something that could literally never happen is happening. It's very Chuck Palahniuk of him, I feel. Like, I feel like Haunted is one of those novels that, novels, short story collections, that when you read it, you're just like, this is so engrossing and captivating and you believe that everything could happen and then looking back at it you're like that would never happen and I can't believe I was lulled to believe that it could. That's how I feel about this book. Um, and it is really disturbing. It's really really disturbing. The ending isn't my favorite thing and it doesn't make a lot of sense to me but the journey of getting there I think was really really worth it and I had so much fun with this novel because I really went into it thinking I was gonna hate it and I loved it. <laughs> I really loved it. Okay. Next up, I had to include a Christopher Triana novel. I recommend everything by Christopher Triana, but I wanted to pick something that wasn't Gone to See the River Man because I talk about that book endlessly on my channel, and I wanted to pick something that wasn't Ex Boogeyman because I've been talking about that book quite a lot recently because I did just read it. But this is The Prettiest Girl in the Grave. Um, this is probably his funniest book. It's really quite dark humor, and it's really absurdist, and it's really over the top, and it's still very macabre and disturbing um but it's also like a book that I kind of want to read like every October because it's just such a perfect atmosphere and again it's ridiculous and terrifying at the same time and like the characters are <laughs> the characters are just so out there but I love them and I loved reading this book uh, it's not my favorite thing by Triana but it's definitely um, more tame than Gone to See the River Man, and kind of in the same vein as Ex Boogie Man, where it is, again, this kind of scary slasher-style story with a lot of gore and a lot of disturbing imagery, but it's got such a level of dark humor in it that you're kind of down for it, you know? It, it reminds me of, again, like, the cheesiness of an 80s slasher, you know? But the, the actual contents of itself isn't cheesy. Um, I would love to see this as a film. I think this would make an amazing, amazing movie. Um, kind of fit in like the R.L. Stein's Fear Street series. That's kind of the vibe you get with this. Sirens. All right, so I'm gonna read the back of this book. From the author of the international horror sensation, Gone to See the River Man, comes a new tale of terror that will drag you to the darkest corners of the soul. Some girls are fearful, others are brave. One girl's a princess, the next one a slave. But all girls are equal when they're down in this cave until just one is left standing, the prettiest girl in the grave. It's only supposed to be a game. When Bella, Celeste, and Rose meet with new friends at a graveyard in the woods, they soon realize they're unprepared for what's planned. At 20, Aubrey is older than the high schoolers, and she knows of a secret game that's been played by local girls for decades. It starts with personal questions, but quickly moves on to a test of courage as Aubrey guides them into an underground crypt. But even Aubrey doesn't know what they're really getting into. Bella's mother, Holly, may be the only one who does. As a teen, Holly and her friends also played the game, and Holly barely survived. When she discovers her daughter has gone to the graveyard, she fears Bella will get lost in mysterious catacombs, just as she had, and face the same sinister forces. As the girls search for a way out, Holly must return to the dreadful crypt she swore she'd never come back to, and finally face her own dark secrets. Another thing I love about this is this book play... This book pays so much homage to um, Edgar Allan Poe's Fall of the House of Usher, um, primarily the storyline of Madeline Usher, um, in a way that, 
like if you watched Mike Flanagan's The Fall of the House of Usher on Netflix, it's completely different. It's his own interpretation, um, but you can really see where he derived his inspiration from, and I really, really loved that about that. This is kind of what I would have wanted from um, T. Kingfisher's What Moves the Dead, which is her own interpretation of The Fall of the House of Usher. This is like a weird, absurdist, contemporary retelling of the story of Madeline Usher, sort of. Um, without being that blatant. So if you're a fan of Poe, I think you'll pick up on a lot of the references and have a lot of fun with it, but it's still very, very, very different from Poe's short story. Okay, next up. The Haunting of Ashburn House by Darcy Coates. I always recommend this book. This is always my number one recommendation from Darcy Coates. It's the first book I ever read from her. It's the book that got me into her style of cozy horror, and I will always, always encourage people to read it. I'm gonna read the back. There's something wrong with Ashburn House. Everyone knows about Ashburn House. They whisper that its old owner went mad and restless ghosts still walk the halls. But when Adrian, desperate and in need of a place to stay, inherits the crumbling old mansion, inherits the crumbling old mansion, she only sees it as a lifeline until darkness falls. Strange messages are etched into the walls. Furniture moves when she leaves the room, and a grave hidden in the depths of the forest hints at a terrible, unforgivable secret. Something twisted lives in her house. It's hungry eyes ever watchful. Chasing the threads of a decades old mystery, it isn't long before she realizes she's become prey to something deeply unnatural and intensely resentful. She has no idea how to escape. She has no idea how to survive. Only one thing is certain, Ashburn's dead are not at rest. This book is so good. Um, this is, in my opinion, the, the most Darcy Coates book that Darcy Coates has written. It is perfect cozy horror. It is set in a small town. It has an extremely likable protagonist. It is scary, it has twists and turns, and the imagery in it is downright unsettling. Um, absolutely, if you want to introduce yourself to Darcy Coates or you are looking for something that is just the pinnacle of her style of writing, this is the book to go to. I have yet to read a book from her that I think I love as much as this book. I devoured it. I literally remember reading it right before I had to go to work and I like almost was late to work because I was like, I have to finish the book because if I go to work and I haven't finished this, I'm going to be so upset. And it was not disappointing at all. I adore, adore, adore this book. Okay, not going to talk about this book too, too much because I have been talking about it a lot recently on my channel as well as in person. But this is Sallow Bend by Alan Baxter. Um, I had never heard of Alan Baxter before this book. I got this in my Twisted Retreat and I read it and was obsessed with it. I believe it was my second best book of 2023. It is phenomenal and I think anybody who was into like the Stephen King, Ronald Malfi style of writing will really really appreciate Alan Baxter's work. Read the inside flap. Something old and deadly has awoken. When two teenagers go missing from the small rural town of Sallow Bend, the residents come together to search for them. Little do they suspect that finding the wayward girls will be the start of their problems. An old evil is rising, and only one man seems to realize that everyone is in danger, and this is not the first time it's happened. In the carnival in town, people want to have a good time, but for many, this will be the worst time of their lives. This is just absolutely fantastic small town horror with unlikely heroes and overwhelmingly powerful forces of evil against them in very unexpected places. And I just want to kind of leave it at that because I think this is a book that is great to go into blind and then you're just going to have so much fun unwinding the mystery. Um, and I can't wait to read his upcoming novel, Blood Covenant. It should be in my upcoming Twisted Retreat May box. And if it's anything like this book, I know I'm probably going to love it. Now I've said that, I'm scared I'm going to like jinx it and just be like, oh no, it's terrible. But Alan Baxter is on my list of authors I need to watch and see where they go because this book really, really impressed me and really knocked it out of the park. Okay, we only have three more, guys. Next up is My Heart is a Chainsaw by Stephen Graham Jones. I had to throw this in here because for years I talked about how much I disliked Stephen Graham Jones as an author, and this is the novel that changed my opinion on it, and I love the Indian Lake trilogy, and this is book one. I'm going to read the inside flap. You won't find a more hardcore 80s slasher film fan than high school senior Jade Daniels. And you won't find a place less supportive of girls who wear torn t-shirts and too much eyeliner than Proof Rock. Nestled 8,000 feet up a mountain in Idaho, alongside Indian Lake, home to both Camp Blood, site of a massacre 50 years ago, and, as of this summer, Terra Nova, a second home celebrity Camelot being carved out of a national forest. That's not the only thing that's getting carved up, though. This, Jade knows, is the start of a slasher. But what kind? 
who's wearing the mask? Jade's got an encyclopedic recall of every horror movie on the shelf, but will that help her survive? Can she get a final girl trained enough to stop all this from happening? Does she even want to? Isn't a slasher exactly what her hometown deserves? This new novel by the New York Times bestselling author of The Only Good Indians, Stephen Graham Jones, called one of our most talented living writers by Tommy Orange, explores the changing landscape of the West through his distinct voice of sharp humor and prophetic violence. Go up the mountain to prove rock. See if you got what it takes. See if your heart, too, might be a chainsaw. This is told primarily through the eyes of a third, of a 17-year-old girl, 17-year-old girl, um, who I absolutely adore and love. A lot of this book is broken up by essays about her love of slashers. This is absolutely a novel for somebody who loves 80 slashers as much as Stephen Graham Jones and his main character do. Um, but it being that love letter is what makes it so fun and so self-aware and at times really, really scary. Um, this also has a lot of... This also has a large amount of feminist undertones in this book, which I found really, really well done, really strong, and really um, tasteful. And I just absolutely adored it. And I read, I loved the sequel to this story um, and can't wait to pick up the third. But if you're not a fan of Stephen Graham Jones, this is definitely the book that will change your mind on him. While I really still don't like anything else that I've read from him outside of this trilogy, this I do think is a standout novel. All right, next up, I have Rosemary's Baby by Ira Levine. Ira Levine. I never remember how to say that. Also, there's like construction going on outside of my apartment and I don't know what's happening. It kind of sounds like somebody's like slamming a skateboard against the dumpster, but I apologize for that. Anyway, I wanted to recommend Rosemary's Baby. I know it's very old, but I just read it for the first time. I've loved the film since I saw it and I know that they're about to make a prequel. Um... Julia Garner and okay we'll see um I don't know how I feel about that but I do adore this book and I would love to go and I would love to go back and see the Bramford setting in a film so I'm not mad about this but this book is worth all of the hype that it gets um I guess I'm gonna read the back of the book but I feel like if you're on this channel you probably know the premise of Rosemary's Baby because it is so famous but I'm just here to tell you that it is worth all of the hype and it is as good as the movie and I adore this and I think every horror fan should absolutely pick this book up. It says, one of the best-selling books of all time, Rosemary's Baby is a foundational work of suspense and psychological horror which remains a powerful and which remains as powerful and chilling as the day it was written. Hailed by Truman Capote as a darkly brilliant tale and adapted with near total fidelity into the monumental film starring Mia Farrow and John Cas Cassavetes, I never say that right, Ira Levine's Rosemary's Baby ushered in the era of contemporary horror as we know it, opening the floodgates to later works such as The Exorcist and The Omen. Levine ingeniously fused gothic literary tradition with modern day New York, creating an enduring classic which the New York Times placed on its recent list of the 25 most significant New York City novels from the last 100 years. Rosemary Woodhouse and her struggling actor husband Guy are thrilled to move into the Bramford, a sought after Manhattan apartment building prized for its Victorian details and gargoyled facade. Yet as they learn of a darker side to the building's history and become acquainted with their overly attentive neighbors, the Castavets, unspoken tension enters unspoken tensions enter into the young couple's relationship. Matters improve when Guy lands a major role, and Rosemary at last becomes pregnant. But her pregnancy takes frightening turns. Rosemary begins to question if her neighbor's heightened interest is strictly innocent, or if their motivations, and those of Guy himself, pretend terrifying consequences for her and her unborn child. Is Rosemary going mad or going sane? I love this book. Um, one of my favorite things about this novel is not only like the crazy amount of feminist undertones in the story, which very, very similar to the tones in My Heart is a Chainsaw, um, but I, I love that the setting of this story becomes a character itself. And I think that's one of those things that's very, very hard to do, but when an author does it, it just elevates the story to a whole new level. And the, the Bramford, and I always think of it as the Dakota because that's where they filmed the movie, um, is just such an amazing location to have this set. And seeing it in the book just brought it to life in ways that even the film couldn't do. And it just made it so much scarier and so much more tangible and so much more believable. And I adore this novel. I think it's so well written. Even though it was written in the 60s, the language still holds up for modern day. You'll read this so quickly, you won't want to put it down. It's fantastic. And it expands upon the story in ways that the film doesn't. The film is very true to the book. 
um, but this book has even more than the film was able to put in and I think that's super important as well. Alright and last up, No One Gets Out Alive by Adam Neville. I, I guess I ended with like all pro-feminist novels written by male authors which is weird because especially in like male horror we get like the men writing women cliche all the time which I just read These Things Linger and I forgot to say this in my review but that happens a lot and it's real awkward. Um, but these last three books are very very tasteful in how women are written and No One Gets Out Alive I think is one of the scariest books I've ever read and I say that pretty much any time I talk about Adam Neville but this book is so scary especially the first half. It's kind of broken into two halves. One that is very much horror rooted in reality and then the second half that is a little bit more uh, cosmic folk horror that Adam Neville is really known for but Adam Neville knows how to write scary and this book is one of the best ghost stories I've ever read and it is so unsettling um, and it's huge it's 630 pages so I actually guess it's longer than A Child Alone with Strangers. You'll read this so quickly. I read this in just a matter of days um, and as unnerving and terrifying as it was didn't want to put it down and it's the book that stuck with me the most out of everything I've read from Adam Neville and I think I've read every almost every novel he's ever written at this point. <laughs> so the back. When Stephanie moves to a notoriously cheap neighborhood of Birmingham she's happy to find an affordable room for rent that's just large enough not to deserve her previous room's nickname, The Cell. The eccentric albeit slightly overly friendly landlord seems nice and welcoming. The ceilings are high and all of the other tenants are also girls. Things aren't great but they're stable. Or at least that's what she tells herself when she impulsively hands over the money to cover the first month's rent and decides to give it a go. But soon after she becomes uneasy about her rash decision. She hears things in the night, feels them, things or people who aren't there in the light, who couldn't be there because after all her door is locked every night and the key is still in place in the morning. Concern soon turns to terror when the voices she hears and presence she feels each night become hostile. It's clear that something very bad has happened in this house and something even worse is happening now. Stephanie has to find a way out before whatever is going on in the house finds her first. No one gets out alive will chill you straight through to the core, a cold merciless fear inducing nightmare to the last page. Word of caution, don't read this one in the dark. I debated putting uh, Let the Right One in on this list because it's, it's a book that I do always recommend um, as like the best vampire story out there. This I think might be my favorite ghost story. Um, it's definitely up there. It's a really interesting way to do a ghost story um, where the the ghosts actually kind of become like secondary to the plot itself um, and it's the, the motivations of the living that become what makes this novel so downright terrifying um, and just kind of like the concepts of ghosts and what they mean and how they interact with us. It's very Guillermo del Toro, uh, very Crimson Peak in nature with this novel and I just love this. It's a dense book um, but you will read it so so quickly and you will be on the edge of your seat the entire time and it will scare you and it will unnerve you. Definitely check the trigger warnings on this. A lot of awful things happen to uh, our female uh, residences of the of this apartment complex but oh my god is it so freaking good and it's so freaking scary and I feel like a lot of times we read novels um, and they are scary concepts but they don't actually unnerve or scare us the way that watching something on a screen does. This is one of those books that I think is truly definitely scary and will stick with you months if not years after you've read this book because I know that's the reaction that I had with this. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. These have been my 10 books that I have been currently recommending in the horror genre. Um, as always, I try to post every Monday and Thursday, sometimes on Saturdays. And if you enjoy these videos, please hit the like and subscribe buttons down below, and I will catch you on the next one. Mwah.